Hey, welcome back to uh, this little video series that we're calling uh, The Songs That We Pray. Uh, this week we're talking about a song called Miracles, which is written by a host of people and popularized by Jesus Culture. Now, the first time that we sang this song here at Moncton Wesleyan uh, was April 3rd, 2016, which gives it kind of a warm place uh, in my heart since it was so close to uh, the beginning of my season here uh, with you. This is one of the first songs that I had the opportunity to introduce to the congregation. Now, as for the central claim of the song that our God is a God of miracles, I mean, just open the Bible to any random spot and you're pretty likely to find something miraculous. And we're not gonna take the time in this video to look at too many examples, but if you're really curious for a place to start, maybe just uh, check out Acts uh, chapter three, verse six. Now the book of Revelation has been central to the gathered worship of the corporate church over the many centuries. And the bridge of this song uh, grabs some inspiration from a very, very popular verse in there, uh, Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And the story of the song in particular uh, is really encouraging and challenging to me. As I understand it, uh, it was written not so much in advance of a miracle as it was on the tail end of a season where uh, a miracle was sought after, it was sought after with tears, and it just was not scene. One of the primary songwriters lost his baby boy during childbirth, and uh, this declaration of faith in the God of miracles, it came as a result of that tragic loss. So listen, as a church, I mean, you know, both on paper and, and in practice, we believe that God works miracles, that he did it during the Old Testament times, he did it during the New Testament times, he did it in the history of the church, he does it today, but why? Why does he do them at all? And why not all the time? I mean, we can't know why God intervenes in some situations and why he doesn't in others. It's just not ours to know. But what we do know about the stories and the miracles that were captured in the Bible is that they were never on demand and they were never designed to impress. They were always connected to salvation. They either accomplished or supported God's ultimate plan of creation redemption, which is the most miraculous theme of all, the God who brings the dead to life. Ephesians chapter two begins, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Grace. This is a miracle that we observe regularly in our church, and I am beyond grateful for it. Yes, we have seen a host of other miracles as well, and I pray for even more undeniable visitations of God's power in the season ahead. But regardless of what we currently see or experience, may we be able to join our voices with those who live and die in the certain hope of Christ that we too believe in the God of miracles.